Good evening readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and back for another bookish bedtime with more discussion of books from Beirut. Um, not necessarily specifically from Beirut, but books that I read while I was there. Um, so I've got two books to mention today. The first is Only in London by Hanan El Sheikh and the second is White Masks by Elias Khoury, which I read on the Kindle. Um, so yeah, where to start? I will just say, uh, not to be shamelessly plugging my own video, but just for context, um, last week I reviewed An Unnecessary Woman by Rabbit Alamadine, and at the start of that video I did a little um, kind of very brief summary of some events in Lebanese history that I thought were relevant for understanding the context behind these books and the kind of the story behind these books, I suppose. Um, so if you are thinking, I don't know very much about Lebanon, and you didn't see that video, potentially go and check out the first half. So I will link it in the description. So to start with, Only in London by Hanan El Sheikh. Um, my mum and I actually read, uh, so that's Roz from Scandley Dandling about the books. Um, we read the Thousand on One Nights um, adaptation that Hanan El Sheikh did uh, for discussing drama back in November. So I will link that one in the description as well. Um, I have to say I enjoyed A Thousand and One Nights significantly more than I enjoyed Only in London. Um, but this is not just about criticising the book, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about the author as well. Um, so Hanan El Sheikh is an author and a journalist. She is, um, according to multiple sources that I've read, basically considered to be like one of the um, defining writers of Arabic, uh, female writers in Arabic of the present day, um, if that makes sense. So she's like a real um, leading figure, I suppose, in the literary scene um, and recognised in various ways for that, if that makes sense. So she was born in Beirut to quite a strict Shia background, um, so that's a, a branch of Islam, um, and a relatively conservative background as well. She was educated in Cairo and then in Lebanon, then she moved back to Lebanon um, and then she moved to Saudi Arabia with her Christian husband during the Civil War and she now has two children and she lives in London. Um, so she's moved, she goes back and forth quite a lot from Lebanon, but she's what you would call part of the Lebanese diaspora. So um, there are more Lebanese people living outside of Lebanon than there are living inside of Le Lebanon and that stands true for Rafa al as well. So she, what does she do? She, her works typically um, essentially challenge norms around uh, sexuality and modesty and because of that her books are banned in some countries. So basically they're, because of her conservative family um, and conservative background, she really saw the impact of those um, norms on modesty, sexuality, female, the position of women um, quite uh, forcefully impacting on her own life and on her mother's life. She's written a biography of her mother where she talks about her mother's um, being forced into marriage at a very early age and then later basically eloping with a lover and the impact that that had on kind of family life um, and then also she has stated that she got into writing at an early age um, to let out her frustration at her father and brother and the restrictions that they had on her life um, so because of that impact that she had from that um, more conservative um, side of the spectrum um, background she writes quite a lot uh, in protest against that. Um, so I can't remember what I mentioned, but that has meant her books have been banned in several countries in uh, the um, Gulf region, I believe, um, just because they are quite explicit. And yes, I would have to warn you that Only in London is fairly explicit when it comes to sexual scenes. Um, so yeah, so she started writing at an early age, like I said, because she was frustrated with a lot of these restrictions. And she was seeing her works getting published from the age of 16, so that's really impressive. And since then she has been writing journalism, short stories, plays, um, fiction, like and like I said, a biography as well um, throughout her life. And she's she was born in 1945, so she's had a very long, um, intensive literary career. There's a lot of different books by her to check out. Um, her works have been criticised for giving, um, and this is in quotes, a wrong impression of Arab culture. Um, I would be interested to know who said that, like whether they were potentially somebody who was upset by the voice that she was giving to women that were restricted. Um, but then I think it, it's fair to say that in any situation there is a, there is a spectrum and it sounds like her family was maybe um, even stricter than the norm, so potentially the, the perspective that she has is that she's talking about the stricter side of things, but when her re works are widely read outside, because she's one of the few female um, Arabic writing women who gets translated, when, when her works are read outside of Arabic, um, 
the Arabic speaking world, people might get that impression that she speaks for the whole experience, I guess. Um, but she, yeah, like I said, she's seen as a very influential writer of fiction um, and other things. I'm really tying myself in knots today. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed A Thousand One Nights. Uh, well, I think I really enjoyed it. Don't really remember. I, I found it very interesting, um, but I didn't much enjoy it Only in London. So Only in London is a story of um, four people who are on a plane to London and they go through some turbulence that means that they interact with each other very briefly in like the first page um, and then subsequently stay in touch and keep, keep in touch with each other over the coming months. Um, it's a multiple point of view book but it doesn't really handle those multiple points of view very well. Um, one of them just kind of drops out towards the end and it's it's a bit weird um, because he was a voice at the start and then he becomes less of a voice. Um, and I found the other voices just not very distinctive and not necessarily very inspiring. So I read a summary of most of um, Hanan al Sheikh's major works when I was um, preparing for this video just now and I noticed that this is the only one of her books that is described as being comic and I think potentially the comic style just really didn't work for her it's like she's trying to she's kind of trying to deal with serious issues but she's also trying to not take them too seriously and it just ends up in a, a little bit of a mess where she it kind of seems sometimes like she's ridiculing her characters um, but also that she's trying to write something like tender and heartfelt but just not quite getting there or she's trying to argue that there's a meaning in this book that there kind of isn't it's a bit it, like it's a light read but it's not supposed to be a light read or something like that um but it's it's not a light read because the text is very very wooden um so it's always a question that I have when I read um books in translation it's like is the style issue for the writer or is it for the author? Um, it's definitely something that I have noted a couple of times specifically reading Arabic books in translation. I think Arabic is a really, really beautiful language when you read it in Arabic, but I think quite often when you translate the style of Arabic sentences almost directly into English, um, it struggles to come across with as much life as it has in the original, if that makes sense. Um, and I would say that is probably the case here if we're gonna give Fanan al Sheikh the benefit of the doubt. That said, um, the other book that I'm going to mention today, White Masks, um, which the cover has disappeared, um, definitely doesn't have that problem and that's also a translated work. Um, so yeah, whether it's translation or whether it's the author, it's very, very hard to say. I would say that the style of this did remind me a lot of Nawal al Sadawi, who is an Egyptian author, um, who is mentioned a couple of times in um, articles that I read about Hanan al Sheikh, and they're both seen as being um, female Arabic language writers um, who are very influential and who are very willing to tackle those themes of um, sexuality and so on. Um, so I guess it's inevitable that they end up being com um, compared when they're one of the two of the few that are actually translated into English. Um, but there, I would say there are some stylistic similarities and I don't know whether that was purely because it's a stylistic similarity in the way that Arabic tends to be written or whether Hanan al Sheikh was in some way influenced or inspired by Nawal al Sadawi. Anyway, the other issue that I had with this book, or the other thing about this book that really made me think, is that one of the characters has some definite questions about his sexuality and his gender identity. Um, I think if you wrote this book today, you would handle that theme very, very differently. Um, I would say that that character, maybe if you wrote about it today, you would maybe give them a, a gender neutral pronoun or talk about what they, they want their pronoun to be. Um, he's definitely in this book, he's referred to as a he the majority of the time and then once or twice um, he gets referred to as a she because um, he is like trying to present as a woman. Um, the character, like I said, there's four characters and one of them drops out, but of the other characters, of the other three he's the one that really gets the kind of like the short straw and the depth of his experience is really not there um and he is having this really complex experience but it's kind of not really explored very well um and it's kind of just like edged around if that makes sense and most often he's the character that's kind of played for laughs or made to look ridiculous and i found that upsetting in a way because i felt like there was a lot of potential in his storyline if it had been handled slightly differently um he is 
it's, it's quite funny actually, this book is from I think 2000 or 2001 um, and the complete lack of aeroplane restrictions I just found utterly hilarious. Uh, 2001, yeah. Um, and he carries a monkey onto the plane with him and a lot of his story is about him and his monkey and I, like, I liked the scenes with the monkey, I thought they were quite endearing but I felt like his character lost out a lot because most of his scenes were about this monkey um and I didn't like the way that he was portrayed as being like the whole of his characterization was the monkey and a couple of bits of, about his sexuality um that it, it just wasn't particularly rounded um compared to the other characters where I almost felt like I had kind of too much about them um in terms of their um sexual fantasies and stuff that, you know, just, 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 just too much for me. Um, yes, what else? Um, yeah, and going along with that, I felt like the relationships that were set up in this book were not necessarily very believable. Um, so that's not a very great review of Only in London, but I looked at it on Goodreads and it is probably her worst rated book. Um, so probably not the best one to go for. Oh, the other thing that I had to say was, and this is a difficult one, it's like the vision of London that she, um, described was really it really didn't feel familiar to me and you could definitely argue that she's she's writing about areas of London that are mostly um Arab people are living there so these there's one of them's Moroccan one of them's Lebanese uh one of them's Iraqi but lived for a long time in Lebanon um so her characters are like from a variety of different Arab backgrounds um so you could argue that she's writing about areas of London that I don't know so it, it wouldn't be familiar to me um, and it would be familiar to her as somebody who is um, from an Arab background who is living in London. Um, but it's not those scenes that don't feel f like that don't make sense to me. It's the scenes where like they're in the park and like people approach them and stuff like that. Or like the way that they go to hotels and get into taxis. It just doesn't fit with how I know things work in London, if that makes sense. Um, so I found, found that quite jarring sometimes. Um, I would definitely read something else by Hanan El Sheikh though and I would definitely recommend her as an author, I just wouldn't specifically recommend this book. Unless you think it's the kind of thing you'd really enjoy. Um, in which case go ahead and read it. Um, so yes, that was um, Only in London by Hanan El Sheikh. The last thing that I wanted to say about this was last week when I was talking about An Unnecessary Woman, I talked about Alia's bookshop in Beirut. And I got this in Alia's bookshop. Um, they had a shelf. Um, I mentioned last week that the cafe was significantly damaged by the explosion on the 4th of August. Um, they had a bookshelf that was marked up as, I can't remember exactly what it said, but basically these books are reduced in price because they were damaged during the blast. And and the sign said, careful of, careful of bits of broken glass. And I kind of thought that was a little bit almost tongue, tongue in cheek, but I was reading this and glass was falling out onto me, um, which I don't know, it just felt very... Yeah, I don't know what the word is, but it was like, oh. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I was at, at a very big distance from that event that happened that was a very, um, severe and traumatizing event that affected many many lives in the city that I then went and worked in um but in a way like seeing the little tiny bits of broken glass was the thing that made me feel almost closest to it because it was something uh much more small and much more tangible a lot of people um spoke about the blast but I was very wary of kind of I did like I didn't I'm not I wasn't there to ask questions about it and like probed in, into people's experience of it because it, it's a traumatic uh, memory and it's definitely not a memory that um, any old person should go and talk to somebody about um, unless that, that person is really wanting to explain uh, their their experience unless it's a very voluntary thing so it wasn't like I was going and, and probing people for what happened during the blast um, because that wouldn't have been appropriate in any way um, but it just kind of brought it home to me a little bit more um, seeing those little bits of broken glass like the level of how every single thing in somebody's house or every single thing in somebody's area um, would have been affected in in those really tiny ways. And even to this point, a lot of reconstruction has happened, um, but most people are still physically 
brushing the broken glass out of their, their, their lives, out of their apartments. And a lot of things have not been rebuilt yet. Um, so yeah, so that was the other, th that was the other interesting thing about this book, I suppose. So moving on to the next one. It's White Masks by Elias Corey. So Elias Corey or Cowrie, I think probably Cowrie, um, was, is a, um, or was born into a Greek Orthodox Christian family in Beirut. Um, and he was a really interesting guy. I found out um, as I was reading about him to prepare for this video. So he basically, um, when he was a teenager, decided to travel to Jordan. He was like a university student, decided to travel to Jordan um, to a Palestinian refugee camp and joined, essentially joined the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and uh, participated in their, I, I don't know in what capacity, um, but in one of their like resistance branches uh, starting from 1967. So that was a time of um, obviously a significant war in the area that I have temporarily forgotten the name of. <laughs> Didn't write it down. Um, he then moved back to Beirut, um, finished his university degree, trained further in Paris, and then came back um, again and began working as a journalism, uh, uh, as a journalism, as a journalist. Um, at the start of his work as a journalist, he mainly focused on Palestinian issues um, and the the news surrounding the conflict, um, and kind of worked on and edited pieces related to that. Um, he then later kind of expanded out to cover theatre and the arts as well. Um, he is known for being a author and also a public intellectual, if that makes sense. Um, so he's quite a well-recognised figure um, in Lebanon, apparently. Unlike the other Lebanese authors that I've mentioned, he apparently stayed in Lebanon for the majority of the civil war. Um, which is impressive because a lot of people who had the means to um, understandably did flee. Um, he apparently was really, um, had a really deep belief in um, the potential at the start of the civil war to uh, bring about actual lasting change. Um, and obviously, um, along with many other people became disillusioned with that um, as the war went on. Um, I think that really shows in this book, so White Masks, this was written in Arabic in 1981. It wasn't translated into English until like 2010. Um, but 1981 was in the middle of that civil war period, which was from 1975 to 1991. This was 1990, sorry. This was basically written during a lull in the Civil War and it deals with, um, yeah, it's interesting reading it because it deals with the last few years as being the Civil War in this kind of blissful ignorance that more war is coming, um, which is, is kind of sad in a way because it deals with how destroyed everything already is um, by the conflict that has already gone on. Um, and that's a common theme in his work, apparently. Um, this is the only thing I've read by him, but it sounds like he's written a lot of other very interesting works that often look at human behaviour in times of conflict and particularly often with a focus on um, Palestinian voices and um, Palestinian refugees. Um, he, as a writer, um, uses dialect, dialect a lot of the time in his writing. So if you don't know, Arabic is divided into modern standard Arabic, um, also known as Fusa, um, and then the language that people speak um, on an everyday basis um, is like their local dialect, so um, like Amia. Um, so in Lebanon, that's like specific and different to the one that they would use in Egypt, for instance. Um, so he uses dialect in his writing, and I think you can really tell the difference um, in this one, because this is very formal um, in terms of writing style, not all the time, but quite often. And this, like I said, it's quite wooden, but this is really like quite raw and quite lively. And you can tell that the translator, which is Maya Tabet, um, has had to put some thought into how to render that informality in his writing style in her translation, if that makes sense, I think. Apparently, a lot of his writing still is in MSA, Modern Standard Arabic, but he just uses more of dialect than other authors would do. Um, yeah, because he believes that um, that gives the best uh, kind of impact and uh, uh, kind of uh, impression, sorry, of the, the real like social lived aspect of life, if that makes sense. So, um, one thing to say about Elias Khoury is that he has been um, recently accused of anti-Semitism because of the, some of the themes in his most recent work, Children of the Ghetto, My Name is Adam. Sorry, excuse me. Um, I have a little read around this topic and I would say you 
probably can't judge that without actually reading the book and reading the context. As I kind of alluded to in my previous video, um, if you're <laughs> If you're judging a work that comes from an area where there has been that really um, intense history of difficulties um, between those neighbouring states, um, to judge it as anti-Semitic anti without considering like every other aspect that's involved, um, I would say it's probably very easy to put that label on an author who is writing about Palestinian the Palestinian viewpoint. I think it would probably be very difficult for him to write as many books as he has done without writing some paragraph somewhere that you could interpret as being anti-semitic but I guess it's about unpacking whether that is the point of view of the author or the point of view of the characters um, and like I said I haven't read the book so I can't judge it. Um, I did read about what the book is about and um, one of the main characters basically uh, doesn't know whether he's a Muslim or a Jew um, because he's growing up somewhere in uh, uh, in Israel but in a Palestinian area, I believe. Um, so it sounds like a really interesting book. So um, in an interview I found with him from 2005, which was really interesting, I'm going to link it below, um, he describes his writing as um, it's repetitive, but every time you repeat, you change. Um, and he says that that's because of the influence of a style of Arabic music called Tabet. Tabet? Tarab, sorry, Tarab. Um, and I would say that's definitely true of White Masks. It's a really clear stylistic feature that he keeps coming back to the same scenes and the same moments, um, but telling them slightly differently and giving it slightly a slightly different perspective to the character. So basically, this story is a murder mystery, but it has no solution, which I did find slightly frustrating. But he tells you, like, on literally on the first page that you're not going to get the answer. I just didn't believe him. I just somehow thought that there would be an answer somewhere. There isn't. Um, so it's about this man who his son died as a martyr in the early years of the Civil War. Um, and there's a lot in this book about the concept of um, martyrdom and what what's a good cause to die for, I suppose. Um, and it's about this man gradually deteriorating and um, fragmenting and turning into uh, somebody who has no firm basis in his reality and the name White Masks comes from the actions that this man then takes um, of um, removing the faces from things and like how um, those faces and those identities, uh, he sees, I guess, the way that he sees the, the, the meaning behind those faces and how it's changed because of the mental impact of the loss of his son. Um, so it's really, really fascinating in terms of an exploration of the impact of the conflict on people. Um, and it begins with that man being found dead. And I guess the, the question is, is his death deliberate or is it just part of the mean, meaningless chaos of war? And I guess the conclusion probably leans towards the meaningless chaos of war, but you've still got this kind of like question in his mind, in your mind of like, did he know something or did he do something or like what, what actually went on there? Um, this is very brutal. It's very much like, it's about war, but it's really, really about war. Like, it's not a kind of distance approach. It's really about um, people in the streets or people in their houses getting very physically affected by violence. It should come with trigger warnings um, because it is quite vicious at times. But I think that is his point. Like, he wants you to read about how horrific it was and think about that, if that makes sense. Um, and I did, and I enjoyed it, if enjoy is the right word, it definitely isn't. Um, but I found it very, very engrossing, um, I should say. Um, yes. And there's, I guess that the thing with Figgy, the murderer never being um, revealed, or the cause of the murder never being revealed, is you get this sense of something incomplete. And that's another th theme that he kind of talks about in his work, in terms of, like, you, we as people, we never really have the whole story, so it's kind of disingenuous in a book that purport, purports to be realistic. It's kind of disingenuous to give us the whole story. Um, and the incompleteness in the context of that, like, that war and the, the state of the war that wasn't completely resolved, um, yeah, it, it actually fits really well with the book. It's just like, I'm really used to reading, I like murder mysteries and I'm really used to, like, knowing who the murderer is, so yeah, there was that frustration there.
So I definitely recommend this. He's written a lot of other books, so I would also say check those out as well. Um, and on the whole, I really enjoyed the books that I read from Beirut. So thank you very much for listening. Um, it has been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it. And take care. Speak to you soon.